Welcome to the Vintage Hollywood Archive. Gene Seberg is a myth, an icon whom everyone has heard of, but no one knows. Her tragic destiny is riddled with mystery. She was one of the first stars to speak out on major issues. Probably no movie actress suffered more from a combination of misogynist Hollywood politics and reactionary Washington politics than Gene Seberg. Why Gene Seberg had to be neutralized by the FBI. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you're new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Vintage Hollywood Archive channel. Gene Seberg, star and victim. Secret Lives of Gene Seberg. Gene Seberg was one of the most appealing, intelligent, and enigmatic movie stars of the 1960s. She worked a lot in Europe, mainly in France, where, acting in films directed by Jean-Luc Godard and Claude Chabrol, gained a lot of popularity in France and a BAFTA award. Jean has become one of the symbols of the French New Wave. So far, she starred in 34 films in Hollywood and in Europe. However, in the late 1960s, Seberg became interested in politics. As a result of that, her name appeared in several scandals. In fact, Seberg became one of the best-known targets of the FBI COINTELPRO project. Unfortunately, during the last decade of her life, Seberg's mental health deteriorated, due in part to a miscarriage and harassment by the FBI. She died at the age of 40 of a barbiturate overdose in Paris on August 31, 1979. Her death was ruled as a suicide. Hollywood is less a place than a fantasy world where myth and reality are often so entangled that few can tell them apart. Suicide? Murder? Conspiracy? What really happened to Jean Seberg, the film icon and activist found dead in her car on August 30th, 1979? A mysterious end for a woman who led a life of passion, always in search of freedom, love, and justice. Throughout her life, she crossed paths with filmmakers, lovers, and allies, as well as enemies who cast a menacing shadow over her last days. Did someone want Jean Seberg to disappear? There is no truth. There is only passion. When talking about Jean Seberg, there are at least 50 different truths. There are mostly passions. There are many possible versions of her life. People have written plenty of books without ever capturing the truth. It's a story that emerges between the lines, telling of a person who is tragic, magic, impressive, and untouchable. If you want to understand Jean Seberg, most of the time, she is Joan of Arc, her first film, and the rest of the time she is Lilith, the film she did with Robert Rawson and Warren Beatty, where they were all locked up in an asylum. It was always very interesting to observe this double nature. She was tragically doomed, 20th century predecessor. Defiantly staring down the camera's gaze in Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, the image of Jean Seberg, blonde hair, cropped pixie short, her thumb tracing the indifferent line of her lips, all but invented modern cinema. She was the Midwest American, plucked from teenage obscurity, who became the enduring poster girl for the new wave. She was also, more infamously, placed under surveillance by the FBI for years, when J. Edgar Hoover and his goons deemed her association with the radical Black Panther Party a threat to national security, which contributed to her depression and was a factor in Seberg taking her own life in 1979. She was virtually Jean Seberg, destroyed by the FBI. Jean Seberg was born on November 13, 1938, in the city of Marshalltown in the U.S. state of Iowa. She was the second of four children born to N. Seberg, the town pharmacist, and his wife, Dorothy. Her mother's lineage goes back to the Mayflower, 
which means she came from an extremely Puritan family. She used to pray at church. Marshalltown was a quintessential Midwestern American town whose adult inhabitants were, according to Jean, grim, kind, dried-up people who were afraid to open up. In this church-going conservative community, young people were expected to conform, but from a young age, Jean was different. She was extraordinarily sensitive. Her grandmother used to have her read poetry. From a young age, played on the stage of the school theater. She was always speaking out to protect animals. Once, when she came home with a bunch of animals, her father asked her why, and she replied, they followed me home. Then, when she was 14, she joined the American Civil Liberties Union. Later on, she stood up for women's liberation and Native American rights. She even offered them a building in Marshalltown where they could study. She was an activist by nature. At the age of 14, she applied by mail for membership in the Des Moines chapter of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Her school friend Hannah Haley later recalled, Jean had a very strong idealistic streak. Joining the NAACP was just another instance of her being different. She probably didn't understand the philosophy behind it, but she certainly loved every little living creature. One of Jean's favorite activities was visiting the cinema. When she was 12, the local movie theater screened The Men, starring Marlon Brando. After seeing the film, Seberg walked out of the cinema feeling strangely shaken. Brando's ability to convey emotion through his performance was unlike anything she had seen on screen before. She made up her mind that she wanted to become a famous actress. One person who took Jean's aspirations seriously was the high school drama coach and speech instructor, Carol Hollingsworth, who gave the student what she called her DDT lecture. Acting requires drive, determination, and talent. Jean soaked it all up avidly, and from then on, her course was set. Before long, under Hollingsworth's guidance, Jean was entering oratorical contests at one-act play competitions. In her senior year, she was cast as the lead in the school production of Sabrina Fair. Performing in front of a thousand spectators at the Marshalltown High Auditorium, Jean proved herself unnatural on stage. Most of us knew then, recalled Stephen Melvin, her high school music teacher, that if she really wanted to pursue an acting career, she could make it. After Jean's graduation in 1956, Carol Hollingsworth arranged for a scholarship enabling her to take part in a season of summer stock theater in Cape Cod. Jean's parents were reluctant to let her go, but were reassured by her promise that, after the summer, she would enroll at Iowa State University. In summer stock, Jean was cast as the female lead in William Inga's Picnic, opposite an actor called John Maddox, with whom she fell in love. Together, they planned to secretly move to New York and study acting at the revolutionary Actors Studio, where Jean's idols Marlon Brando and James Dean had studied The Method. But before the summer was over, fate intervened when Hollywood director Otto Preminger announced in a cinema trailer that he was undertaking a worldwide talent search for an unknown actress to play the lead in his film adaptation of George Bernard Shaw's play about the life of Joan of Arc. Initially, Jean dismissed the contest as a gimmick, but her drama teacher successfully persuaded her to send in an application. Originally from Austria, Otto Preminger began his career in the theater before establishing himself in Hollywood after the war, directing popular film noir mysteries. By the early 1950s, he had become an independent producer slash director with a reputation for adapting high-profile plays and novels which challenged the restrictions of the production code censor. Any film with Preminger's name attached was guaranteed to draw attention, and St. Joan was no exception. Jean was one of 3,000 hopefuls to make the first cut and offer of an addition after an initial 18,000 actresses submitted applications. When Preminger saw her, he said, Everyone out. She's Joan. Preminger later admitted that something clicked as soon as he saw Seberg. 
She had the spirit of Joan of Arc inside her. Not that she heard voices, but she had that inspired, rebellious side that led her to stand up for all minorities. She was a pioneer of the 1970s activists. Preminger was furious when he started working with Jean, believing her to have overprepared. On the day of the test, he drove her mercilessly, insulting her and forcing her to repeat difficult scenes over and over. The story of Jean's discovery, with its echoes of Hollywood's golden age, captured the imagination of the public. Her small town origins were an essential part of her appeal and a source of pride for Marshalltown, who organized a parade to celebrate her return. Preminger controlled every aspect of Jean's life. He kept her isolated from the outside world at the Dorchester Hotel and made sure all her free time was taken up with preparatory tasks for her role including intensive elocution lessons and hours of horse riding. On set, she found herself working with some of the finest actors of the English theater and felt overwhelmed. Preminger, according to some observers, was using a form of psychological warfare to elicit from Jean the performance he wanted. On set, the director pushed Jean through dozens of takes until she became confused, often in tears. Some of the other more experienced actors on set were shocked by the way Preminger was treating the inexperienced actress. The climactic scene of Jones burning at the stake was scheduled for the final week of shooting. With Jean chained to the stake, the pyrotechnic effects were ignited, but something went wrong and Jean was caught on fire. Despite his frequent criticisms, Preminger developed a grudging admiration for Jean's strength under pressure. In 1958, Preminger invited her to his next film, a melodrama, Bonjour Tristesse, an adaptation of the acclaimed novel by Francois Sagan, published four years earlier. During the shooting, which took place on the French Riviera, Seberg met with a French lawyer, Francois Morel, and soon married him. The couple settled in Paris, where the actress was taking French lessons, singing and acting. In 1960, Seberg appeared in the movie The Change, Shortly after filming, Jean filed for divorce. Next, she starred in the film of French director Jean-Luc Godard, one of the pioneers of the French New Wave in the drama Breathless. This film has become the most famous with her participation, and the role brought the actress a lot of popularity in France and a BAFTA award. She became an icon to French youth, for whom she represented the epitome of modern, liberated womanhood. Suddenly, her image was everywhere, on magazine covers and billboards. Girls began asking hairdressers for Le Coupe Cibur, a close-cropped hairstyle that was her trademark. Her look became the new ideal. Suddenly, she was in demand, and directors everywhere wanted to work with her. She began an affair with a famous writer, Romain Gary. Jean's private life became increasingly difficult to hide. In July 1963, Jean gave birth to a son, who was named Alexandre Diego Gary. For Jean, however, fame came at a cost. With the French press following her every move, she began to feel her life was no longer her own. This was particularly difficult, given that she was seeing another woman's husband. The pressure mounted until one night she became hysterical and began smashing things up in her apartment. Francois drove her to the American hospital, where doctors had to give her an injection to put her to sleep. It was agreed that she would return home to Marshalltown for a period of rest and recuperation. She survived and even thrived, acting in 40 films between 1957 and 1976 alongside Hollywood all-stars, including Clint Eastwood, Peter Sellers, Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas, and Warren Beatty. In the late 1960s, Seberg became interested in politics, with the result that her name was involved in several scandals. So, the actress supported the National Association of Colored People, advocated for the rights of Indians. In addition, she has provided financial assistance to the activists of Black Panther, a party that fought for the rights of African Americans in the United States. Seberg grew up socially conscious. She was incredibly vocal and infiltrated political circles to advocate for her causes. 
After achieving film success, she donated money throughout her career to aid the Meskwaki settlement in Tama County. Seberg also bought a house for black students attending Iowa Valley Community College. But a donation to her friend, Hakeem Jamal's Montessori School in the Compton neighborhood of Los Angeles, put Seberg in the crosshairs of the FBI. Jamal was a member of the Black Panther Party, a far-left group that fought conditions for African Americans in Oakland, California. The group was involved in both social outreach to the poor and underserved, and violent clashes with the police. It came to the attention of the FBI, whose agents kept files on celebrities and others who had ties to the Black Panthers. FBI agents investigated Seberg. Hoover, who was later proven to have kept illegal files on thousands of private citizens never charged with a crime, found Seberg's association with the Black Panthers so egregious that he wrote, quote, unquote, Gene Seberg must be neutralized, FBI records showed. From 1956 to 1971, the FBI ran COINTELPRO, covert and sometimes illegal operations to discredit groups Hoover found objectionable. The operations targeted communist organizations, feminists, anti-Vietnam War activists, civil rights activists, and others. On the night of her death, Jean called Romain Gary and told him, People want me dead, warned Jacques Chirac. Gary didn't respond. He was tired of getting so many calls about similar threats all the time. Except that time, she disappeared for 10 days and was found naked in the back seat of her car after allegedly committing suicide with 8 grams of alcohol in her bloodstream. 8 grams is impossible to digest. You wouldn't even be able to stand up straight. There were certainly some strange details in the case. It seems odd to lay naked on the back seat of your car if you're going to kill yourself. She was naked and wrapped in a poncho without her sunglasses, which she needed to drive. And the car was covered in brush, leaves, and dirt. Another odd thing is that the autopsy result that was kept in a small vial, even though it is difficult to obtain reliable analyses 10 days after death. The lock on the cabinet was broken and the vials had disappeared. She didn't save the world and the world didn't save her, because the end of her life is simply tragic. It was like a descent into hell. She bothered a lot of people, caused scandals. She was out of control. But to go back to Jean Seberg and all the iconic stars of the time, we never remember her activism, how she fought for the rights of black people, the Black Panthers, women, animals. Instead, we remember her haircut. We remember her as a fashion icon. Young people today do not remember who Jean Seberg was, but they want to get her boyish haircut at the salon. We realize that she already had that haircut in Bonjour Tristesse. She was also the pioneer of a look, a bit like Andy Warhol. It was a signature look. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you are new here.